All right, I am going to call the Wednesday, July 15th, 2015, Dr. Cog board meeting to order. Um, can we all rise to say the pledge? Okay, we're going to move on to the consent agenda, uh, attachment A in your packets. Oh, I am so sorry, I'm trying to skip ahead. We have to make sure we're all here. We're gonna do roll call, Connie, please. <laughs> Eva Henry, Eric Hansen, Bill Holland, here. Elise Jones, here. Dennis Harward, here. Tim Mock, Tom Hayden, Chrissy Panganello, uh, Anthony Graves, here. Robin Kniech, <laughs> Roger Partridge, Gail Watson, Connie McLean, Don Rozier, Bob Pfeiffer, Bob Roth, Sue Horn, David Spellman, Suzanne Jones, Tim Plass, Ann Justin, Rick Pilgrim, Lynn Baca, Cynthia Martinez, George Teal, Kathy Noon, Doris Chular, Ron Engels, Catherine Heider, Laura Crisman, Here. Gail Christie, Richard Champion, Jim Benson, Rick Teeter, Debbie Nasta, Joe Baker, Todd Riddle, Laura Keegan, Randy Penn, Joe Jefferson, Dan Woog, Mark Gruber, Joyce Thomas, Here. George Heath, Samantha Meering, Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Henry Ergot, Lynette Kelsey, Paula Bovo, Doris Rigoni, Sasha Karis Graves, here. Ron Rakowski, here. Mike Hillman, Brad Weasley, Stacy Luberger, Shakti, here. Jerry Bean, here. Phil Sernanik, present. Jackie Malay, here. Gabe Santos, here. Ashley Stolzman, here. John O'Brien. Connie Sullivan, Colleen Whitlow, here. Deborah Jerome, Sean Foray, Chris Larson, Joe Gearlock, Joyce Downing, Carol Dodge, John Dyack, here. Gary Howard, here. Rita Dozel, here. Val Vigil, here. Herb Atchison, here. Joyce Jay, here. Gary Sanford, Deborah Perkins Smith, here. Bill Van Meter, here. And we do have a quorum. Wonderful, we have a quorum. Um, may I have a move to approve the agenda? So moved. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstained? We have an agenda. Uh, moving on to item number five, report of the chair. Um, first of all, I would like to ask the lovely lady to my right to stand up so, so everyone can see you. Um, this is Donna Thompson. Donna is a professional registered parliamentarian, and she's been one since two th the year 2000. Who knew that existed? Come on, who knew? They do. So Donna has, uh, has an extensive resume, and she's served as a parliamentarian for a wide number of groups. As those of you who are able to join us at the board workshop um, in February, we talked about ways to improve the... Um, board dialogue, debate, discussion, and motion process. And we talked about, um, even though our articles right now call for following Robert's rules of order, I think we all have our own unique interpretation of what that means. And we now have a professional in the room who can actually tell us what, what it should mean to us. And I know all of you attorneys out there are experts, but you have another consultant here at the table with us. Um, I think this is an opportunity for the board to maybe create some of its own rules. Uh, those of you who participate in the process know that the city of Centennial has modified Robert's rules and tailored them somewhat to the organization to allow an opportunity for better discussion and debate by the body and better decision making by the body. Donna is going to be joining us to um, kind of watch the interaction and um, at some point we will be engaging the board in a dialogue, are, are there some better ways that we can improve things? Um, so if you would all welcome Donna and be on your best behavior because she's taken names and numbers. Um, she's not, but thank you Donna for being here.
Pardon? I'm writing notes. Oh, and she's writing notes. God knows I'm going to get a handful. All right. Uh, the other thing I'd like to discuss with you guys this evening is the, um, R, uh, the RTC, Regional Transportation Committee, met yesterday morning and moved to uh, approve um, the 2016-2021 TIP amendments that are going to be on our action agenda uh, item later tonight and the Unified Planning Work Program that it will also be on our agenda. Um, we also had a really, I know I'm a little bit of a geek, but very interesting briefing by Ryan Rice from CDOT that talked about how we potentially can optimize the capacity on our existing uh, interstate freeway system. I, I think Mayor Rakowski might want to add some comments. Mayor Crispin, uh, I think it's by far probably the best CDOT briefing I've seen sitting here in this room ever. Yeah, I think it was thought provocative, and I think it's something that we, this board may be interested in hearing a piece of, uh, I think. And if, uh, yeah, go ahead. No, you go ahead, Mayor. <laughs> if, if any of you have Interstate 70 or Interstate 25 running through your jurisdiction, you need to see this briefing. Ryan Rice will be happy to send you a copy. I've got a copy and I'm distributing it to my uh, city council and senior staff and our police officers. Okay, you stole my thunder. It's fine. <laughs> I'm okay with it. Um, no, it really was excellent. So at some point we might bring it forward to you guys. Uh, and with that, um, I also want to say I had the pleasure of attending the ribbon cutting. Thank you, Mayor Atchison from Westminster for uh, the US 36 project. If you have not had an opportunity to drive or see that project, I think it's a phenomenal example of what regional collaboration, partnering with the state and federal government and this body at Dr. Cog, it's another region you should all be proud of yourselves for the work that's done at this table because it's an excellent project that's gonna make a huge difference on the region. So uh, kudos to them. Uh, and um, we look forward to borrowing some of the great ideas that they're doing there uh, in our own community. Uh, I think that's it for me with the exception of me. Yay. <laughs> so it is my honor and pleasure as vice chair to get to recognize Jackie Malay for her years of service. And for anybody who's new, the way we do this at Dr. Cog is if you survive five years. You, you guys all buy me. Yeah. Well, there is that but you get a beautiful clock. Now, as has been noted by past board members, this is sort of a magical clock because you get it in theory after five years, but it always feels like it's been 15. That's what's known as Dr. Cog and Dr. Cog dog years. <laughs> and you'll see that, that the big hand it refers to tip cycles and the little hand is Metrovision updates. So you have earned this. And I will say, you know, I've only got to be at the Dr. Cog table for a couple of years, but that's long enough for me to uh, know and understand firsthand the value that Jackie Malay brings to this, this gathering. First of all, let's note that she never leaves you wondering what she's thinking or how she feels, huh? This is not a shrinking violet. We always know. And then she has this great quality of always injecting humor into the situation, which I guess is a time-honored Douglas County tradition. But let's note, she is a lot funnier, or at least her jokes are, than Jack Hilbert was. And we, she also happens to have better fashion sense than Jack Hilbert, but I, I'm off topic now. But seriously, we appreciate your commitment to regionalism, to getting to yes, to collaboration, and we appreciate you also getting us out at nine as chair. Our vice chair is not finished. So um, as was noted at the admin committee, um, we just completed asking you all to fill out a survey for the personnel evaluation for Jennifer. <coughs> and it turned out to be a technological gauntlet, which some of you survived and some of you didn't. So I want to, on behalf of SurveyMonkey, apologize, um, even though, as Mayor Rakowski pointed out, it wasn't my fault, but still. Appreciate everybody's willingness to hang with it. As part of that process, I promised 
um, whoever was the first non-board member uh, to fill out the survey would get a, a reward. Um, Bob Roth actually was the first person, but he deferred to the next non-board officer, which was John O'Brien from Lyons. And the gift that I brought John, which he's not here to appreciate. Can I trade him for the clock? <laughs> is I thought, all right, one thing that, you know, not, not everybody loves Boulder, I understand that, but we do a few things pretty well, and one of them is brew beer. And I thought, what better to, to, to bring a Boulder brewed beer called Collaboration. Oh, I love it. So you'll get that. <laughs> and because I felt so bad about, and Jerry Stiegel and I were in the trenches trying to, to help people through getting through Survey Monkey, the other thing that Boulder does well is we make chocolate. So, and this is Choco Love Chocolate. And so I wanted to show the love to those board members who had to fill out the survey more than once. I think people had to fill it out as many as three times. Some of you tried three times and then gave up. I'm just gonna read off the people that went through that. And if I missed anybody, you let me know. And you get to pick from the bag of chocolate before you leave tonight. So these, this is a credit to your tenacity and commitment to Dr. Cog, Sue Horn, Jackie Malay, Laura Brown, Ron Rakowski, Shakti, Debbie Nast, uh, um, Don Rozier, Gary Howard, George Teal, Gabe Santos, Ashley Stolzman, myself, Bill Holen, and Phil Cernanick. I don't know, did I miss anybody who had to do this repeatedly? Let's, a round of applause for you all and chocolate after the meeting. <laughs> All right, that's the way, clocks, presents, chocolate, adult beverages, that's the way to start a meeting. All right, we are now moving on. Jennifer, what have you got for us? We're used to getting gifts now. So our, the report of our executive director, Ms. Schaffel. Oh, God. That, well, I'm sorry, I didn't bring a gift. Um, I know, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll bring one next time, I promise. Um, just want to bring you up to speed on a couple of things. After the last uh, meeting of the Metro Vision Issues Committee, um, it was clear that we needed, uh, actually meeting before last, uh, we needed a way to look at the discrete pieces of the Metro Vision um, 2040 draft plan, but somehow do it in the context of the whole plan. And so with MVIC support at the last meeting, um, we're adjusting the approach to uh, reviewing and marking up the draft plan using a strategy framework for uh, MVIC to review the, the draft plan in a, in a more linear fashion. Um, once we go through the document using this methodology, um, MVIC will have actually reviewed and marked up the lion's share of the language that's in the MetroVision 2040 draft plan. Um, Connie actually, I think, has copies of um, uh, kind of the explanation that I'm giving you right now, but on the back side of that is the uh, revised uh, anticipated schedule for um, adopting the plan. So if, we st if we're able to stick to this schedule, uh, the draft plan would come to the full board um, in, in December with an adoption uh, in March. I also want to say that we've already received some um, comments and some suggested edits to the plan. Uh, those will be um, uh, brought uh, to MVIC as we get, uh, as we go through the plan. If you or your staff have comments that you haven't submitted, please go ahead and do that now. We will provide them to MVIC as we're going through those, um, uh, those uh, specific things. So again, if you want to look at the, um, the copy of the schedule on the back, uh, tried to clearly line out when, who was doing what. So uh, August through November, we expect MVIC to be doing that markup. This will be a red line copy of the, um, uh, of the uh, draft that you uh, received. In fact, I, th I think some of you have probably um, received multiple copies of, of the draft plan, but um, we'll keep a red line version of what the MetroVision issue committee is going to recommend to uh, the board. So, and we will find a way to have that out probably through the board portal that you'll hear more about this evening. We'll find a way so that you can go out there and keep track of it. I want to remind you too that everyone on the Dr. Cog board is invited and welcome to come to MVIC to participate in these discussions. The chair has always recognized um, uh, members of the board who uh, participate uh, who aren't on MVIC but want to uh, participate in the discussion. So uh, please feel free to provide um, 
comments that way as well. Send us your written uh, comments. You can call and talk to staff. There's lots of different ways to continue to provide input all the way through uh, the December board meeting. So unless anyone has any questions about that, uh, yes, sir. Commissioner Partridge. Mr. Thank you, Jennifer. Appreciate it fully. I'm a question regarding the red line draft. You know, that mm -hmm. always has been an issue for me for a long time. And I uh, appreciate that we did receive a red line of the draft, but I have to say I think it was very confusing. But my question is, when we look at November, uh, we talk about a red line version. Is that a red line version of our 2035 plan? Because that is the plan we are working off of. So my suggestion should be, would be that the red line is off of our 2035 plan as opposed to the draft since the draft is not an accepted document. Mm -hmm. Can I? Jennifer. Um, I, I understand that that is a, a cause of concern for, for you and others. And um, the challenge that staff has had is that the way the 2040 draft plan was put together by lots of community input, by um, uh, committees of the board and others, uh, things have been moved around so much that the entire document would end up being a, a big red line document. Um, but what we can do um, is to identify as we go through it with MVIC all of those things that are uh, verbatim from the 2035 plan, anything that's changed uh, from the 25, or excuse me, 2035 plan, we can identify uh, what, those, um, what those changes are. And uh, anything that's brand new to 2040, uh, we can certainly um, identify those as we go through MVIC too. Um, again, we just didn't see a way to do a red line because we, it, the entire document, because of moving text around from one place to another, the entire document would have ended up being red lined if we red lined the 2035 plan. So the red line that I'm talking about is we will take the current 2040 draft plan that uh, you've all received a copy of and any edits that MVIC recommends, those uh, edits will be provided in a red line format to the Board of Directors and for uh, the purpose of a public hearing uh, later uh, in the year. Uh, Madam Chair, yes. I'm going to push back on that because, again, I would like to hear from other board members on this, but a red line is a draft of the accepted document. A red line is, you know, you can have a red line of a draft, but we have not accepted this draft. That's what we're continuing to work on. So how can we have a red line of a document we have not approved? We are, it's a working document. We are working off the 2035, not the 2040. So I will push back and, I again, will request that we have red line from 2035. I realize there's confusion. I realize there's input from other entities, but this is from the, this Metro Vision plan is from this board. So it should be a red line off the 2035 document. And I'd like to hear from others if there is any input. Are there comments? I, I, yes, Commissioner Rozier. Thank you, Madam Chair, Don Rozier. Don Rozier, Jefferson County, I agree with uh, Commissioner Partridge. In fact, Jennifer, what you described early on is a red line. As far as any changes that would be made, there are stroke, you know, you strike through your ad, even if you're changing sections to sections. We do it all the time with um, our, our documentation, our, our um, ordinances, where we move um, wholesale, move from this part of our ordinance to another part, another section of, of, the, of an ordinance. Um, not uncommon, in fact, very common um, to have this done to not to have a, 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 a solid document to compare back to is one, not transparent. If I can't get back to my constituents with what changed from 2035 to 2040, that's not good. And then it's not good for any of us. If we're having to look at, well, is this a draft language that's changed? Or is this original language that's changed? If it's moving from here to here, if we're having to figure, go back and say, what's what, it does us all a disservice. Commissioner Jones. Um, I understand um, 
the two commissioners' comments, uh, the desire to understand the, the change between 2035 and 2040, and I share that. And um, but So it would be interesting to see how staff can, can display that information. That I think the key is that, that we have that information, that MVIC has that information as MVIC's initiating a look at something that, that, they, that MVIC members have an understanding of the change that's being proposed. Once MVIC starts working through the document, I guess at that point I, I, I think the red lines might get too confusing. So I guess maybe if we could, I would feel good if the board portal could have a document that tries to outline the differences between 2035 and 2040 proposal that staff have developed. However, is, le is clear and maybe it's a red line or maybe it's, it, it's some other version that it, if that's too cumbersome. And then, then I'm supportive of having a document where the, the work of MVIC can be easily seen redlined separate from that because I think combining that might get awfully difficult to read. So that would be my two cents. Are there any, any other comments? Council Member Teal. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll speak in favor of uh, uh, making the red lines against the 2035 document uh, just to the fact that um, um, I, I don't have that continuity, um, having only been on the board here for a little over a year now. I don't have that continuity to uh, necessarily what was done before. So that would help provide that continuity for me. And yeah, sure, maybe there is a time when uh, you know we do what Commissioner Jones suggests and we have to sunset that and actually move into a formal draft. But I believe that's still within uh, the intent expressed by, uh, um, by Roger. So uh, I, I very much speak in favor of that. Are there any other comments? Yes, Mayor Crispin. It, it's, not, it's not. Oh, on. sorry. Not good at this. That's OK. Is this really a software issue? Do you have the software to achieve? I mean, I'm Don saying that his, yeah, but to to end up having something that looks like it's been totally redlined is not what you want. Exactly. And that's not what you want either. And this is really a software issue. Do you have that software to do the initial changes so it doesn't, you know, it shows it's the same language, but it's in another place, which would have to have a, like a pink color and then later, later you have all of the side language that says now these are additional changes from MVIC. I mean, it will be confusing. Um, I'm the master of red lines, which <laughs> does not have a legal definition, by the way, and, as you, and are rarely red anymore. They're like pink and green and blue, depending on what day did what. Uh, and it's my understanding that it's what system you have. Do you have it so that yeah. you can address this for them? We, yeah. we use um, Microsoft, the, the whole office suite, so we have whatever's in there. I'm not sure it's a, it's a software problem per se. We can certainly go through and mark up what is, um, what is, what is changed. But when something, uh, when something changes, okay, it gets redlined, and then, and then it gets moved. So then all that change now gets redlined as well, and the new language gets moved someplace else. So to know that it was new, it doesn't look new when it, I mean, it, the whole thing looks new, even though only part of what was, uh, what was changed is new. And that's our concern is it doesn't, the redlining as I know it at least in Microsoft Word will not accurately depict um, what um, what was um, modified and then moved because it'll all look brand new. It'll just be underlined uh, as opposed to anything else. So we couldn't figure out a way to help you see exactly what was changed. Staff did put together what they called a crosswalk and I, I understand that it was not um, as straightforward as maybe we would like it to be, but the challenge that we have with the red line is that we're, we're just we couldn't figure out a way to depict um, these changes, especially when text was moved, was changed, and then moved as part of developing the draft, helping you understand what what was 
A, changed, and, and B, what, what is new, and, and making that distinction between the two. Um, I am actually going to try and make sure everyone has an opportunity to participate in the discussion this evening. So before I call on someone who has already spoken, I want to ask if there's anyone who has not spoken yet that would like to speak on this issue. Seeing none, Commissioner Rogier. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, from what has been described here multiple times um, by Jennifer, this is, this is not as simple as a uh, a modification. This is in the legislature. This is a strike below. This is a rewrite. If that's a rewrite, then we see everything. We don't even take we don't take action on what's changed. You take action on the whole new rewrite and the whole new document. So if we're gonna if we're gonna talk about modifications, even if something has not been changed from 2035 to 2040, it's open for discussion. Every document, everything, that'll slow up the entire process. Just so you know, because that opens up the entire document for change, modification. Oh, and, and I actually I think that's very fair, and I think that is true. Every time we, we, we are going to be opening up this entire document for discussion and debate, it's our 2040 plan. It's a new plan every time. I think it's nice to know where um, we were in the process, what, what was there, and so for my benefit, I actually would like an executive summary that does outline uh, any new additions to the 2040 update, um, any changes uh, from language policy that was in 2035 to this 2040 document, and anything that was completely deleted from 2035 to the 2040 document. I think that is the summary that staff was talking about providing to this body, but Commissioner Rogier is exactly right. This entire document is open for discussion and debate by this body, and this will, it will be the 2040 vision from the board members that are sitting here voting on the plan. So are we all clear on that? It is a strike below. It is. I, I just want to clarify, yeah. that's the case every MetroVision exactly. update. That's the way it's always been. We get to write the document. It basically re-examine everything in MetroVision. OK. Are we, are we, is there any additional comments? Are we good? I think given the interest of time, we do move on. I think as you see the document as it comes through, if it is not meeting the expectations of this body, I think staff will certainly work to uh, provide the information and change the changes, deletions, additions. If it's not clear to this body, we will always ask staff for more clarification. Okay. Uh, Jennifer has a final comment. Um, yeah, I just want to tell you a little bit about uh, the August board meeting. Um, we're going to start that debrief of the TIP process. Um, I think in the end we ended up with a, a, a solid list of TIP projects, but the process to get us there was pretty painful uh, from time to time. Uh, and I know that many of you are eager to discuss how we do this better going forward. So uh, we're going to start that uh, discussion at the August uh, board meeting. Uh, that'll just be the beginning of the discussion. After we enter into that, it'll be up to you to kind of uh, decide how we keep that discussion moving forward, whether it's through a subcommittee, whether it's through surveys, whether it's through more discussions with the full board or a combination of those. You'll have that discussion in August as well about how to keep this, uh, this conversation going until we figure out what you want to do to improve the TIP going forward. And that's uh, Councilmember Member Kanish. Well, you have already gathered um, feedback from the technical people. Since they're the ones who submit the TIP projects, I just feel like they have an important perspective, and I'd rather have them weigh in first than after us. The, the TAC has uh, started this conversation, and, and they have some ideas for you to consider. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to see those in August, then. We'll yes. be reacting to something they've already processed. Yes. That's super helpful. Thank you. Okay, and I just want to reiterate for this body that the MVIC committee, which meets on the first Wednesday of every month, is going into a deep dive on the MetroVision document. And even if you are not appointed to MVIC, your participation is not um, only welcome, it's encouraged. Uh, I, I think we would all benefit from hearing what our partners at this table have to say about the vision of this region for 2040. So we get to spend more time with each other. Um, all right. Anything else, Jennifer? Okay. 
But I'm moving on to agenda item number seven, public comment. Up to 45 minutes is allocated at this time for public comment. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. I request that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before this board. Consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. Anyone? All right, I'm not giving you a lot of time because we're running late. So public comment is closed and we are moving on to our strategic informational brie briefing. Uh, we have the pleasure of having Ken Lloyd, the executive director of the Regional Air Quality Council here tonight to, I mean, it says give us a presentation on ozone, but I think it's why we care about ozone other than the air quality uh, consequences to all of us, which are very important. We're talking about the current 2008 standard and the proposed new 2015 standards, which will have significant impacts on, on our region. So Ken is here. Thanks, Ken. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of uh, Dr. Scott Board. Pleased to be here tonight, uh, as Jackie said, to give you a update on what we're doing on ozone. That's the critical air pollution issue that we're dealing with here in the metro area. I have to apologize to those of you who have heard this presentation before. Several members of this group are on the RAC board. You've heard it. I think we've given this presentation to every, every committee at Dr. Cog and other groups. So by the time I'm done, you might need that beer and um, chocolate that at <laughs> least possible. There's only one. Oh, <laughs> everyone will get a swig. All right. Um, let me um, start out by first um, giving you a little bit of background on ozone. This is your ozone one-on-one, -on -one, a little bit of chemistry tonight. Um, ozone is a pollutant that's not emitted directly. It's um, formed in the atmosphere, and it takes three um, things to form ozone. One is emissions of volatile organic compounds. This is essentially anything that comes from a petroleum-based product. So um, gasoline we use in our cars, paints and solvents, oil and gas industry, anything that deals with um, petroleum. The second part of that is nitrogen oxides. Again, this is anything that comes from a combustion source. So again, cars and trucks, power plants, um, home um, heating, um, things like that. And then the third important ingredient is sunlight. Ozone is formed, um, again, in the atmosphere. For us here in a metropolitan area, it's principally a summertime issue where we have intense sunlight weather conditions are ripe, that all these pollutants form and we, and we have high ozone levels. In some areas, especially here in the west, uh, we can have wintertime ozone problems and those are mainly in areas with intense oil and gas development, snow, um, snow cover, but we don't have that problem here so we deal with just a um, summertime issue. These sources are varied, uh, again cars, trucks, power plants, just about er any daily activity that we as citizens and uh, businesses do. Um, we, we've dealt with several ozone standards over the years. The first ozone standard was set um, 40, 40 years ago. And um, we were out of compliance with that standard at that time. We came into compliance. Um, about the time that we came into compliance with that standard, EPA set a new standard, and I'll, I'll get into that process a little bit um, later and we were out of compliance with that standard, so we had to do a new plan. We came into compliance with that standard in 2009. About the time we were doing that plan, EPA set a um, lower standard still, what we, what we refer to as the 2008 standard, which is the standard that's currently in place. This was set by EPA in March of 2008. It set at a level of 75 parts per billion. Um, there's a pretty complicated way of the way they figure that. These are hourly values that are taken throughout the region, average over an eight-hour period. Because there's so much fluctuation in ozone because of the weather, we deal with our fourth maximum values, not the, not the highest value. Uh, we were designated as a marginal non-attainment area by EPA in, um, in um, July of 2012, and our deadline for um, compliance was the end of this year. Um, 20, 2015. Um, and as a marginal area, we had few additional requirements. We were basically given a chance to, um, to um, meet the standard with what we were currently doing. Um, this is our trend for ozone, and as you can see, I mean, you probably have to be a statistician to see a trend here, but, um, and, 
and a lot of it is is um, is um, due to the weather. But as you can see, this that um, dotted um, red line is um, is the standard that was set in 1997. We are currently in compliance with that standard, as I said. That green line is the current standard of uh, um, the 2008 standard. We are out of compliance with that, so that's the issue at hand right now. And as I'll get into a little more detail, EPA has proposed a standard that will be even um, even lower. Um, these are our values that we see um, throughout the region. We have the state health department operates about 15 monitors throughout the region, and these that are orange are the uh, monitors that are out of compliance over the three-year um, average, going all the way from up at Fort Collins West near Horthouse Reservoir. Um, sorry, Don, but you can see quite a quite a few there from. Uh, stretching throughout Jefferson County, but you get to share that 82 with um, Boulder County and you get to share the 80 with um, Douglas County. So, but what this shows is that, that ozone is truly a regional problem. And, it's, and, it, and the way the weather patterns, the flow works, is all these pollutants um, kind of meet at the, um, at the um, foothills. So that's why we see our um, higher values in the foothills. It's not Jefferson County's problem. It's, it's not Fort Collins' problem. It's a truly a um, regional problem. And we see those values um, throughout, the, throughout the, front, uh, the front range there. This um, summer, um, we, we had a particularly bad stretch. We, we've actually had a pretty good summer for ozone, but we had a, a bad stretch of four days back in June where we probably saw Meteor meteorological conditions that were as bad as we've seen probably in the last 10 to um, 15 years. So we had some high values at uh, the site down at Chatfield and a site in Golden at, um, at um, NREL. And so these are our fourth maximum values so far this year, higher than what we had, than what we had hoped for. We had hoped for in the, in the, um, the mid-70s. So we're not off to a good start. but. Um, that again was a pretty un unusual circumstance. So we're um, you know we're hopeful and confident that the rest of the summer will probably be um, better than that. So as I indicated um, back in 2012, when EPA designated us as a non-attainment area, we were we were given until the end of 2015 to comply, and if we did not comply, then there were some actions that needed to be taken. There was a um, court decision back in December that kind of threw that on its head. Um, EPA was challenged on some of the um, deadlines there, and the court ruled that the deadline is actually July of this year, not the end of the year. But what that does is that we have to use a full year of, um, of um, data in calculating this standard. So um, actually, we went back a year um, to determine compliance, and it pushed up the whole schedule that we're working on for a year. So what does this mean for, for us? Is that um, we basically know that um, now that, that um, we did not attain the 2008 standard based on data that I showed um, through 2014. Um, EPA is going to bump us up to a moderate non-attainment area. This is the next classification, and there's some additional requirements that we're, that we're going to have to meet. EPA will um, do that probably within the next six months. Our, we have to develop a new plan. And our deadline is we're given a three year, an additional three years to meet that standard by July of 2018. But again, it takes three years of data, so it's 2015 through 2017. So this year was the um, start of that. Now, there are a lot of other areas in the country in the same boat as we are. There are about 46 areas nationwide that were out of compliance with that standard. Uh, there's about 10 that are in the same boat as us we're there, that are going to be bumped up to um, a moderate area, areas like Atlanta, Chicago, San Diego, Phoenix. There are uh, another 10 areas that because they had lower values last summer, um, they're going to get an extension and get a chance to uh, meet the standard at the end of this year. And there's 16 out of those 46 areas that complied with the standard. And then there's another 10 areas that have a more serious problem, moderate and above, areas like Baltimore, most of Los Angeles, or mo and most of California, and, um, and the um, Dallas area. So as I indicated, we're going to have to develop a new plan, and, we've, and we've, um, we've, we've started that. Those of you who have been involved in the past, much of it's the same as what we've done before. We have to do a, 
a pretty sophisticated modeling analysis looking out to 2017 showing that we have measures in place that are going to be able to comply with the standard. A new requirement is we're going to have to put together a plan that will show 15 percent reduction in volatile organic compound emissions. This is a specific requirement in the Clean Air Act. Honestly, it's, it's out of date right now. It's 25 years old, but it's still a requirement in the law. Um, we're going to have to implement reasonably available control measures. We've already implemented a lot of measures, and so we're hoping to take advantage of what we've already done. Our inspection maintenance program will, will remain in place. There will not be any changes to that, but it will affect the North Front Range folks in Larimer and Weld County that currently have the inspection maintenance program, but now that's going to be part of our federal plan. So it won't change that program as such, but it will now be part of our, of our plan. And then if we don't comply with the standard, we have to have contingency measures in the plan that, that have to be implemented in the event we don't attain the standard by 2008. So we are working on that plan now. I mean, we weren't caught totally off guard with the, uh, the acceleration of the schedule. We had a lot of modeling work already underway in anticipation that we'd be going through this possibly next year. But as I indicated, we're doing um, pretty sophisticated photochemical modeling. We're doing that this summer and into the fall. The RAC has formed um, three subcommittees to start looking at strategies, both what we're currently doing and being able to take credit for that and any additional measures we might need to look at. Uh, one dealing with stationary sources, another one dealing with mobile sources and fuels, and the third dealing with transportation and land use. And there's several folks around this table that are, that are involved in that one. Our goal or our requirement is to have a plan completed by next summer. Uh, we have to submit our plans to the State Air Quality Control Commission. They're the actual state body that adopts the plan. So they'll go through their process and their formal hearing next fall. Our plans have to go through review by the legislature. That will be done in the 2017 session. Our uh, measures, any measures have to be implemented, will be um, implemented prior to 2017. And the plan will be submitted to EPA. Um, there are a lot of things that are going on that we're, that we're currently taking advantage of that um, you know, we're confident that will hopefully get us where we need to do. One is just cleaner cars and trucks. Uh, I think if you, as um, you've seen from your analyses of your Metro Vision and your um, uh, transportation plans, mobile source emissions are, are going down because of cleaner vehicles, cleaner, um, cleaner fuels. So we're getting a pretty significant reduction of both VOC and NOx emissions throughout the region. The other thing is a significant reduction in power plant emissions. Um, the Clean Air, Clean Jobs Act, Act was um, uh, passed by the legislature two or, two or three years ago. That's well on its way. Um, Xcel Energy is reducing its, its emissions of NOx principally through the use of natural gas. And then the other big source is the oil and gas industry. And just last year, the Air Quality Control Commission undertook a significant rulemaking and actually adopted the most stringent oil and gas regs of any state in the country. And so we're anticipating that we'll be reducing those, those emissions in the future as well. So we're thinking that those, those are the three big sources and there are things that are underway that are being done that will help us achieve the standard um, within the 2017-2018 time, um, time frame. One thing that would be important for Dr. Cog is uh, the whole issue of transportation conformity. As you know, with your plans that, um, that um, you develop and your TIPs, you have to meet the motor vehicle emissions budgets that are in those plans. We currently have a budget in our, um, that was established by our um, SIP that we did back in 2009 for the 1997 standard. That budget is still in effect. It was in effect for the last round that Dr. Cog did, and it will probably be um, around at least for another two to, two to three years. But as part of our plan that we're developing now, we'll, we will be establishing new NOx and VOC budgets as part of that. Um, they will be lower, I would expect, than what they are um, now. But um, it's probably looking at your next, at your next round of plans that that would, um, that, that would take effect. It also affects the north front, uh, the front range, and their um, MPO, and they have budgets that they that they need to meet as I'm well. So we have a lot of work to do over over the next year. Um, we're all well on our way to doing that, but that's not the 
that's not the final thing. Um, as is the case with most of these plans, once we develop a plan to meet a standard, EPA comes out with a um, new standard. So um, the um, Clean Air Act requires EPA to review all air quality standards every five um, years. So they were required to review this ozone standard in 2013. They didn't do it. They got sued. And so the court ordered EPA to review the standard. Now, they don't have to set a new standard. They just have to review the information. But based on that review, EPA um, last, um, last fall um, pro proposed a new standard in, in the range of 65 to 70 parts per billion. The current standard is 75. 65 to 70, the current standard 75, so it'll be lower. They also propose something called a secondary standard. The um, primary standard is, is to protect public health. Secondary standard is protect public welfare. And ozone does have effect on crops and other things like that. And usually that standard is the same as the health standard. But with this time around, EPA is looking at possibly having a different standard. Whoops. EPA did um, impose a standard last um, December. We got a lot of good news last, um, last December on, on this issue. Um, the 90-day public comment period ended in March, and EPA got tons <laughs> of, um, of um, comments from all sides on this standard. Um, they're under court order to finalize the standard by, uh, by October, so EPA generally reacts to what judges tell them to do, so they'll be establishing something at, by the end of the, this year. And then that kicks in the whole process again, is that the governor will submit non-attainment recommendations by late 2016. EPA will designate non-attainment areas by late 2017. We'll have to do a new plan in early 2020, and the attainment deadline will be somewhere around the mid-2020s, um, 2022 to 2024. So that's not immediate, but certainly something that we need to be um, planning for. Uh, again, we're, um, we're in company by everybody throughout the, throughout the nation. This is a map that EPA put out. And again, there's nothing indicated for California because just about the entire state of California will be non-attainment non for these standards. So um, it's mainly blue. But the, but the dark blue are areas that will um, Based on current data, will not comply with the with the with the new standard in the in the uh, of um, 70 parts per billion. That's about 350 counties throughout the country, including the Front Range. And the light blue, if the standard goes down to 65, um, those um, areas would be would be affected. Drilling down a little more into what it means for Colorado. I mean, obviously, here in the Denver North Front Range region, we will be out of compliance with whatever standard EPA sets since our values are above that. But if EPA sets a 70 standard, Colorado Springs will be, will be um, brought in. Um, out in the West Slope, Rangeley, again, dealing with the wintertime issue, may, may be affected. If the standard goes down to 65, then the Four Corners area down near Durango um, the um, Grand Valley and Grand Junction would also be. So it would be a um, pretty, pretty big deal if the standard goes down to 65. Much of the state will be, will be out of compliance with, with that standard. And um, many of these areas will be non-attainment areas for the, for the first time. Let me skip by this one. Here again is, as I indicated, there are, there are a lot of things that are going on, a lot of things going on locally and at the national level. So EPA has um, done some modeling. Um, looking out until 2025, and this is the results of their analysis based on current measures that are that are in place, both at the state and federal level. Those areas in uh, in um, dark blue would still be out of compliance with the 70 um, ppb standard. As you can see, we're 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 not dark blue, so EPA thinks that with current measures we can attain that 70 standard over the next 10 years. But if it goes down to 65, those areas of, um, of um, light blue would be out of compliance. And with our current measures, we would not attain that standard. So um, that fairly quickly is an overview of ozone. I want to leave a little time for questions since um, this is a pretty complicated subject. But here's our contact information. If you have any um, questions, um, feel free to, to contact me.
So to sum it up, we don't meet the current, the bad news is we don't meet the current standard. The worst news is they're going to lower that standard. So does anybody have any questions for Ken? That's the bottom line, Jay. <laughs> yeah. But, there, I mean, but, but also, I mean, that we, I mean, I think on the positive side, I mean, there are things that, that we have done and are, and, and, are, and are doing, whether it's sufficient to meet the standard by the various deadlines. I mean, these deadlines are pretty precise, and, and unfortunately. But you know, I think we're on the on the right path, and whether we meet it or or not, you know, we're going to be close. My comment was in no way meant to to imply <laughs> that the good work being done at RAC, we have actually there has no, been significant improvement in air quality. There has been, but it, but it's tough. Mayor Rakowski. First off, I want to recognize Ken for his yeoman work of putting the shoulder to the wheel, and this has got to be one of the toughest wheels to move. Is there anything we can do through the special pot of money that you get to reduce that pollution by, well, let's take lawnmowers, for example, which are uh, part of the problem, I believe. If we bought up all the old lawnmowers and encouraged uh, electrics instead, or is, is there anything where we can get down to the consumer level? Well, there's, actually, to things, Excel? there's actually things that we're doing. I mean, as you know, we have a pretty um, uh, aggressive fleet outreach program. So we've gotten money from Dr. Cog in the past to, to reduce NOx and, per, and particulate emissions. We have a, a, a pretty aggressive program on alternative fuels, both compressed natural gas and electric. Um, TDM programs help. The electric lawnmower, that would be difficult because we use CMEC funds, and so it has to be um, on a transportation-related um, topic, but we we just did get a four hundred thousand um, dollar grant from Noble Energy that um, had a pretty significant fine, and as part of that, they are sponsoring a a lawnmower exchange program. It's a continuation of what we've been doing in the past, but one that we're going to have here, but both in the Denver area as well as in the north in the North Front Range. But that other special pot of money, I mean, we're starting to look at that now. Things that we can target. Um, in the near term, Un unfortunately, just the amount of money isn't enough. That's going to have a, it's going to move the needle a lot. But there are things that are being done that are going to move the needle a lot. So, Mayor Sernanik. Yes, uh, Ken. Thanks, uh, and uh, realize try and bring it down. And, and thanks to Mayor Rakowski for trying to say what what can we do at the at the possibly the local level uh, that is not too painful. Uh, that we might be able to uh, to at least champion uh, in some of this, but um, you mentioned on your first page some of the sources of the volatile organic compounds and some of that even being biogenic. Um, is there a breakdown as to, or is it known uh, where those come from? And uh, I have to imagine that somebody's out there kind of brainstorming uh, what reductions are going to come from what efforts. Uh, but maybe to um, get a broader uh, participation in some of that, uh, maybe breaking that down a little bit uh, would be great. Not necessarily tonight, but uh, if you had something that would say, here's the, here's the sources of this and here's what's actually being considered uh, out there, and you may have some folks that around the table that can kind of say, hey, that sounds like something we can maybe champion. Sure. A couple of things there. Um, on our website, we have a lot of information, and we didn't list the one here. We actually have an ozone website called ozoneaware.org. And if there's one website you need to remember, that's that's the one, ozoneaware.org. And on a, on that, we actually have a, a local government handbook where we have put together things that local governments can um, can do to help out. So it kind of lays out what the problem is, but it lays out measures that local governments can do. So. Um, you know, I can I can share that you know maybe with them, Jennifer, and you can get out to the board. I mean, we've I mean, we've shared it with a lot of the local government staff, but you know we you know we need to get that information out. So it's got some practical things that, that local governments can do. It's also got a breakdown by the sources. I mean, we I mean we know where this stuff comes from, um, but one of the complicating factors is that it's since it's an indirectly emitted pollutant that varies. And so um, it, it's, um, it's um, not the same every day. So for instance, oil and gas, 
when you look at the tonnage is a huge source, but when you look at the reactivity of the emissions and its location, it's not as big a source as what that tonnage would show. And so that's why we have to do this sophisticated modeling, and it is pretty sophisticated. I don't do it. We have, we have consultants that do it that take into account all those factors, takes into account weather patterns, takes into account the, reactive, the reactivity of pollutants, the emission inventories, the, the locations of all these sources, and gives us a pretty good tool for um, um, looking at the um, impact of these um, various controls. Okay, if there's one last question. Seeing none, I want to thank Ken for the great partnership and work you do at the regional table with us. So thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. Glad to be here. Okay, we are moving on to the consent agenda, uh, agenda number nine, attachment B in your packets. May I have a motion? And a second? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain. Moving on now to the action agenda item, attachment C in your packets, discussion of a resolution amending the 2016-21, excuse me, 2021 TIP. Todd Cottrell, Senior Transportation Planner. Mr. Th Cottrell. Thank you. Um, good evening, and before you, we have three amendments for your consideration. The first is the Fast Tracks North Metro Corridor. Uh, this amendment corrects the funding, scope, and limits from when the project was transferred from the, tw from the 1217 tip over to the 1621 tip. The second amendment before you is the Southeast Corridor Extension uh, Fast Tracks project. Uh, this is very similar to the last amendment where this one will adjust the funding for when the project was transferred again to the 1621 tip the third and last amendment is the i-70 east reconstruction project um, this amendment is necessary so that the funding in in this tip is accurately reflected what is presently in this step so those are the three amendments before you and i'd happy to take any questions or comments that you may have questions for mr cottrell Seeing none, I'll look for a motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to action agenda item number 11, attachment D in your packet. Discussion of the 2016-2017 Unified Planning Work Program. Doug Rex is going to be handling that. And um, I'm going to mention again, there are hard copies of that document available up here by Connie. If you'd like one, raise your hand. We can pass it down to you or pass it across to you. Maybe send some up on the other side too, Connie. Great. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and good evening to everybody. Um, we have for your consideration this evening the, the draft 2016-2017 Unified Planning Work Program, or the UPWP, or as the my former chair in Oklahoma City used to call it the up whoop. God love her. I mean, she, she said it every time. She knew the difference. She knew it used to, used to get a chuckle out of me, I guess, so she used to keep doing it. Um, that Oklahoma humor? <laughs> yeah, Oklahoma humor, yes, indeed. Um, the document itself, it is a federally required document, and um, within the document, um, we, we are to identify the work proposed over the next one to two years. Um, by major activity and task, in, including activities as addressed in the planning factors. And you recall maybe uh, a couple months ago when Jennifer Higa gave a presentation on the, on the planning process, she, uh, she went through those planning factors. Um, but, you know, of course, you know, we, we have a two-year TIP. It can be a one-year TIP, which we had in Oklahoma City, but we have a two-year TIP, or sorry, two-year UPWP here in, um, in, uh, in the in, in Denver, Denver region. Good Lord, I know. Um, but uh, the, the actual document, uh, according to the federal regulations, um, should have sufficient detail to indicate um, who will perform the work, um, the schedule for the, the, for the completion, the resulting products, and the proposed funding. And I, I hope you would agree that we have more than adequately accomplished those, those, um, those tasks uh, within the document itself. I, will, I should probably also mention that this, this is a product of a, um, a coordination between us and our planning partners, which of course is CDOT and RTD. You'll see uh, in particular RTD tasks in here, which, which is associated with the in-kind match that we use for this program. Um, it was also um, a, uh, went through the Transportation Advisory Committee. We had a couple meetings in, you know, to discuss and, and, uh, and work on this document. So. The Dr. Cog 
UPWP. We ha it's broken out into six sections. Uh, the first is just clearly an introduction, just talking about the purpose, purpose of it. Um, the second section, which deals with uh, the regional transportation planning, um, it, just, it, ref it just refers to the actual, um, how it relates, how this document relates to the planning process and some of the other federal requirements that we do have. I did want to mention two items within that section um, that, are, that, are, that are new, or at least the formatted differently, um, and one is in the relation to the federal planning factors. On page, if you're looking in your document, on page, on page three, um, under guidelines for planning activities, you'll see there's a section there, federal transportation planning factors, and what, I, what we did this time is that we, for the eight planning factors, tr federal transportation planning factors, we went through and identified with the, the task that helped to accomplish those planning factors. So we, I, I've done this previously in Oklahoma City, and uh, I thought it was very useful, and, and uh, it was a good exercise internally, certainly, and I hope it, it, um, it helps you all as well. Um, the third section is the, the planning program for, for the fiscal years. Um, and this is just just a, a general just just a page or so that just talks about the organization of the tasks themselves. We have uh, seven objectives that that the um, that the UPWP is organized under other tasks. So we have objective, then we have um, major activity, and then the task. Um, and those are all, are all highlighted in the activity descriptions in section section four. <clears throat> Which, is, which begins on page 15. That is really the meat and potatoes of the UPWP. And you'll see, you know, under each activity, um, we have the, the purpose of that activity, um, the task, the ongoing task for that activity, um, the participants, and then um, for, for those that have deliverables, um, those, are the, those are listed by, by the fiscal year. Um, so that is, again, if you go back to the original slide, that helps us um, meet those requirements with regard with the, the federal requirements for uh, for what we have to show in the document. Uh, section five of the document: other major planning activities. This is work that is done by, our, our, in particular, our member local governments as well as CDOT and others. Um, that projects that are identified. This is, this, there's two sections to this. One projects that are identified in um, in a previous or current transportation improvement program. They're they're primarily studies. Um, uh, within that section, and we also have, and those those projects are federally funded. There's also another section that just speaks to non-federally funded and local government planning activities, um, which which are there for for uh, for information. Last but not least are the appendices. Um, we have two appendices within this document. The first is the program financial tables, which are a requirement, and they're broken out by by objective. Um, and then obviously tallied um, and, and shown the funding sources for, for our work on the UPWP. And last but not least, um, this, the, uh, in Appendix B, is a matrix of the deliverables by each activity within the document. Um, and it, give, it, it just shows when the expected completion date of, of the tasks are, or, or the, the uh, deliverables are, are expected to be done. Um, uh, you know, this also, it, it's a good, again, good internal exercise for us. It really, really does push us to get those, those, these, these activities done in a timely fashion. But it also will help us with the new super circular requirements that the, uh, that the federal government has. So um, with that, I will be happy to take any questions, talk about any of the, any of the, the, the uh, tasks within the document. I'll just throw it back to you, Madam Chair. Questions for Mr. Rex, Mayor Sinanik. Mr. Rex. Yes, sir. Uh, I noticed that, uh, at least in the uh, introductory attachment, uh, first priority is dealing with MAP 21. Uh, I know you're covering this primarily from a Dr. Cog perspective, but my recollection in some of the discussions and presentations on MAP 21 is it puts a fair amount of burden upon the local jurisdiction for post-implementation measurement. Uh, how much is being done with regard education and recognizing that many of the jurisdictions around this table are going to be going through their budget process uh, to make sure that that is one of those things that's actually included going forward uh, so that 
we at the local jurisdictions aren't messing up? Wow, that's a, that's a very good question. And, and it, it, it is, it's, it's, it's a very complicated issue. I mean, as we know, we're all going to this performance-based planning, and certainly we have tasks within this document that addresses that. Um, I do believe, and I think you raise an excellent point, that there has to be more coordination with the local governments to make sure that they understand what our process is going to be and that we can coordinate those efforts. I mean, it's, you know, it, it's, it's a big mountain, really, I mean, because there's so much, so much, so many requirements anymore, particularly in, in with the super circular requirements. It's, uh, it, it can be a little overburdensome sometimes, but we will be working with, through, the, through the Transportation Advisory Committee to make sure we accomplish that. And, and, as, and hopefully as we can ease, with ease for the locals. Well, with those that have uh, projects that are out there, uh, how much is going to be done on education in the short run, recognizing that uh, there's tasks that will need to happen in 2016? Well, you know, through our Transportation Advisory Committee, we did have a presentation on the super circular, um, and we did invite anyone who, um, not only members of that committee, but those um, who, who have grants through uh, uh, some of our other channels, such as our traffic operations and the like, to make sure they understand that there's, you know, there's, there's pretty strict deadlines with regards to end dates and everything with those projects. Um, yeah, I, I think this is something we probably should do more outreach on, and, and I appreciate you raising it today, because we could, we could certainly get on the ball with that. Any additional questions for Mr. Rex? Seeing none, I'll look for a motion. I think that was a move approval move from approval. Commissioner Jones. Is there a second? second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Okay. We have a unified planning work program. Thank you. Uh, moving on to agenda, action agenda item number 12, attachment E in your packet, a discussion of, the, of synchronizing Dr. Cog's annual work program not to be confused with the unified planning work program with our budget and adopting them together no later than November starting this year and uh, moving the board's annual workshop to the fall early winter time frame of each calendar year. Uh, Jennifer Shuffle, our executive director. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I've heard from some of you more than once that we really need to um, find a way to synchronize our annual work program with our annual budget and, and have those reflected in a single document. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is really a, a smart way to go. Um, Dr. Cog's annual work program, for those of you who um, um, haven't participated in that before, is a summary of the projects that are uh, proposed for a, uh, to be accomplished by staff and consultants over a 12-month period. And it includes the activities that you just heard about in the UPWP. Um, but other program areas as well, like the uh, Area Agency uh, on Aging or a Shared Services Program or special projects like the Sustainable Communities Initiative. So traditionally, the way this has worked and why it's not synced up is we've gotten board input on the work program during your workshop in February. And then the work program um, after staff um, um, takes all that input that, that comes out of the workshop uh, brings it to you uh, typically in the June, July time frame to be adopted. Uh, this past workshop actually was more of a, a learning kind of uh, workshop than a let's set the agenda sort of thing. So there not, not a lot came out of this past workshop. But um, the annual budget, however, it's set on the calendar year. Dr. Cog's uh, all of our accounting uh, is set on the 12-month calendar beginning in January, ending uh, December 31st. And it has to be adopted uh, by your uh, November board meeting. So not unlike some couples, we know the work program and the annual budget are absolutely married to one another, but they're not in sync with each other. So um, <clears throat> the way things uh, are managed today, it's not very easy for us to give you a very clear picture of all the activities that uh, staff is involved in and the funding that's associated with them. Um, in fact, in the package, uh, we provided you with um, the actual budget summary page that the board adopted last November, as well as um, 
as best we could kind of a cross match of the work that staff is engaged in uh, this year. Um, so the item before you tonight is, as Jackie said, it, it recommends synchronizing the work program with Dr. Cog's annual budget, meaning that both would begin January 1st. And it further recommends that uh, we move the board's annual workshop to the fall of each year to get member input into the upcoming uh, work program. And finally, since the board has already held a workshop, but because it was really more about um, learning um, things, we, we went over uh, some rules of order and uh, how different program areas work. Um, I'm recommending for the um, for 2015, we use the August board meeting, the August 2015 board meeting, your next meeting, to review the first combined draft of a 2016 work program and budget. Um, part of that discussion, in addition to reviewing the mandated work um, and uh, like those things that were in the UPWP, for example, a staff would present on um, any known emerging issues, uh, the potential for grant submittals that would be done uh, by staff, opportunities to enter into strategic partnerships, uh, and any kind of other related um, activities that we think we might be engaged in uh, in 2016. You could also at that time react to the format itself and tell us is this what you're looking for? Are we missing information? Is there a, a more clear uh, way to provide you uh, all of this documentation in one, um, in one um, fell swoop? So with that, I'll take any questions. Questions from Ms. Scheffel. So you're all in agreement. OK. <laughs> Commissioner. Well, uh, I, I want to say that it makes a whole lot of logic and sense to me to sync the two up. I mean, obviously they're connected, and to try to consider them at different times has always been counterintuitive to me. Um, and, and in the role that I played before I ran for public office, that is exactly what I did when I presented my annual work plan and budget to, to my board of directors. So I'm glad that we are, are suggesting to fix that now. So I appreciate the proposal. Well said. Yes, Councilmember Kadish. Thanks. Um, I really like also the addition of the realignment of the board workshop. I think it, it has been a great learning tool, but we have not, in my three times attending, done much planning. So I guess what I would say is um, I, I would love us to think beyond just using the workshop as a, as a planning tool. Because the way you describe the work plan or the way I understood it is it's for staff and consultants. I would like us also to spend time thinking about us as a board, like for example, thinking about how we wanted to tackle Metro Vision or, you know, I, I would like us to do some planning work. It's just, it's such a rare thing for us to be away all together and learning is important, but we could probably do more work at it. You know, I mean, not that you don't want to interrupt the drinking, but you know. <laughs> after the work, okay. after the work. Council Member Santos. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm in agreement with this. The one thing that I would request is that we get this, the information at least a week ahead of time in case there are any questions from board members or concerns or we can also talk to our members of staff as well. So in, instead of you know getting it on a Friday, if we can get it the, follow, uh, the, the previous Wednesday. I think it should be sufficient a time that, that staff should be able to get this information to us. Councilmember Jones. So uh, just to clarify, we're going to start this process in August, but are we, we're having another retreat? No. Not this year. Not this year. Not we'll this start year. next year. Right. So the, wh what I'm suggesting is, is that we start the process of going through the combined budget and work program at your August board meeting and um, beginning in 2016 the workshop is held in the uh, in the in the fall late summer early fall so that uh, it is by the time we get by the time you have to adopt the um, uh, the budget in November We've, we've matched up and gone through and reviewed and, and talked about um, what, what the work program looks like and what the budget associated uh, looks like as well. 
So, so our next retreat will be in over a year. Is that correct? That's the way this is written. That's not to say that you all couldn't at any time decide you, you need to get together more often. In fact, I hear this repeatedly, that there needs to be more opportunity. When are we going to go drinking? <laughs> just tonight. I just wanted to put that out there. Actually, I... I Mayor Cernanek. Just as a follow-on to, to uh, Suzanne's comment, um, we may want... Uh, we're, we're starting at the August board meeting. Uh, but how do we move it forward enough so that the budget and work plan are actually for 2016 uh, has opportunity for that synchronization uh, because I wouldn't like to lose a year of opportunity. So you're, you're saying we're starting in August and when are we finishing? Is that, is that the question? Okay. Uh, we're starting in August and we anticipate being finished by your November board meeting uh, for, for this year. Uh, does that, so if does that need, answer your question? So if we need more time, we will allow that time in the uh, September, October board meetings to handle it. And if we really feel crushed, we may ask you guys to come in on Saturday morning and hang out here for a little while. Or, or a happy hour. I, I don't know. Uh, I think a pajama party would be okay. Well, uh, yeah. I would prefer a happy hour, Phil, but you do what you want. Um, but, but I think we're going to see where we get. I guess that's the idea. Let's see where we get in August. If, we, if the body feels that we need more time and maybe coming in for two hours on a Saturday, um, which during my, my five-year tenure on, the, on, the can, on this board, we have done. So we'll, we'll play it by ear as far as that goes. Jennifer. I would say, too, I don't want anyone to be too scared about a Saturday meeting. I think that um, uh, right now the, the agendas uh, through the end of the year look, I'm not saying they're not important, but fairly light as far as the number of items on them. Uh, so I, I think that we'll be able to use um, future board meetings to, to get the work done if, if we can't get it all done in August. Mayor Atchison. I want to go back to Mr. Santos' comment. If we get that, then it behooves us as board members to come prepared. Don't bring it to the meeting and start to read it. So if we're going to get through this, as Phil's talking about, in a reasonable amount of time, we've got to come prepared to go to work. Well said. Do you need a motion to do this? Yes. Okay. I will look for a motion. And... I think Gabe made it, and I think Herb seconded. That's where we're going. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained. You guys, we've been unanimous in all our decision making on the action uh, <laughs> agenda items tonight. That's because so we started right. off with beer and chocolate. It's over. I didn't mess it up yet. It, it is over. We, I, I said we've been unanimous in our, unanimous in our decision making, and I'm going to celebrate that. Uh, we are now moving on to our informational briefings, uh, our attachment F in our packet, presentation on strategic planning model. Jerry Siegel. Uh, just to give a little background, this is the process that the Metro Vision Issues Committee is going to be working through for the document. Um, What's that? Starting at the, the top, you know, with the overarching themes and outcomes. There are five of them associated with MetroVision, just to refresh everyone's memory. So uh, the, one of the purposes, and Jerry discussing this with us tonight, is to prep us a little bit for the good work that we're going to be doing on MetroVision 2040. All right, thank you. Thanks, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, the first, really, I just want to kind of lay out this model. And the first comment I'd like to make is, and I said this to uh, Invic, of course, that terminology and strategy work is one of the first things you must nail down. Um, you can, I can look at all kinds of strategy documents. You'll see all kinds of terms. But in a sense, you really only need about five. So let me start at the top, and I'll just kind of cover from top to bottom this model for a second. Mission Vision was approved by the board last February, so we revised Mission Vision. You'll see it toggle on the slides, the new one. That formed the basis for everything that we should really be able to do strategically. So as you move down, the strategic perspectives really are, and many of you probably have heard me mention the balance scorecard. We're working on that internally. Perspectives give that balance 
to your scorecard because it focuses on community residents' view of the world. It focuses on our financial aspects, our business operations, or internal processes, if you will, and the learning and growth capacity uh, that we develop internally. So those are the perspectives that balance out your strategy. The next you're familiar with is uh, overarching themes and outcomes. We have five of those themes. Those themes represent focus areas for this organization, there are pillars of excellence, if you will, that we must do well to achieve that vision. So it actually allows you to take the vision, which is very long term and broad, and start bringing it down in altitude, if you will, to start focusing on it organizationally. So those five themes that you've seen in MetroVision Draft represent those key pieces from the vision. The outcomes are the destination points. They're like many visions. So if you're, and I use this analogy, if you're planning a vacation, you probably don't start planning and saving for some place you don't know you're going. Most people pick some kind of a destination. Well, that's what the outcome is. So we set that outcome up so we know where we're going to end up. When we develop our objectives, that becomes a little more of our operational strategic component that gives us a continuous improvement that has continuous improvement potential. So if we're going to improve health, one of the things we probably need to do, or if we're looking at people are healthy in the region, we need to reduce VMT or we need to improve air quality. So those represent the objective component that moves you toward the outcome. Once the objectives are done, we put those internally, we, we're starting to work in a strategy map, which is a visual articulation of your strategy. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time, but that's all it's for, is to illustrate visually what your strategy looks like. Once we get through per, our objectives, we start to design performance measures, and there's a specific process to use for designing measures. When we finish the measures, we have a target discussion. If we can come up with a target, uh, we look at the, all these pieces together, and we can come up with something that's not arbitrary, but something that we've talked about. And that actually happened in my office today. We started out talking about an objective and measures, and it wasn't until the end until we established the target, but we could do it rationally. But that's, it has to be done with some forethought. So the last thing on the bottom of that model are strategic projects and action strategies, the things we do. So uh, my colleagues have heard me say, I don't care about what you want to do until I understand what you want to accomplish. Well, the do is the bottom of that triangle, and the accomplish are the outcomes. And we have to lay those out. So, MVIC had a little bit of an advantage to seeing this laid out a little differently, I think, and it might have been helpful. So I'm going to ask you to imagine in your mind's eye that instead of this hierarchy where we have everything stacked on top of each other, let's start at the themes and outcomes and let's put those in a horizontal picture in your mind. So on the far left would be themes and outcomes the ne and a column. The next column would be objectives. The column next to that, performance measures. Next to that, targets. And the last are strategic projects. What that allows you to do is get a line of sight between your outcome and the things you're going to do to achieve it. And between those points are objectives and measures to tell you how well you're moving in that direction. Okay? I thought you had a question. Sorry, John. Okay, we're doing okay? What's that? You are sharing. Oh, yeah. Okay, so you want to... Yeah, that's a, that's a Parker version? No. Oh, that's John, our version? John has the MetroVision version. version. Okay, I wasn't sure. So, so think about it for a moment. If you can actually... Since strategy is linear... It's really not hierarchical. That if you can d design that outcome, and that's going to be a key piece for this group, is to nail the outcomes down. Once we nail them down properly, write them properly, and there's some good work already. I'm telling you what I'm reading when I first got here, 2035, the draft, the work is really good in a content and a structure sense. Now, what, what you decide on will always, you know, dictate that. But still, from a, from a work standpoint, it's fitting all the, it's fitting the parts of the model. Okay. What questions would you have, please? Questions for Mr. Stiegel. I know or Jerry, if you like. My dad's not no. here, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just called Maybe him. he should be. <laughs> yeah, he uh, can't Councilmember Dyack. 
So um, I, I was asking you before, and I'm going to give you the, the floor here, how do you create um, a, a good performance measure? Oh, a good performance measure. A good performance measure cannot be created until a good outcome and a good objective is written. Okay? So if we're moving down this framework too early, we're too early. What we do with performance measures is we really, I can sum it up in basically one question, but there's a little more to it. When we look at that objective, reduce VMT, increase non-SOV mode share, the, basically the flip side of each, right? What's the best evidence that we could have? What would we see? What would we hear? What would we know about that tells us we're making progress on that objective? And we'll speak to it in what's called sensory language. Okay, and I can I'll explain that at some point. It probably don't want to you know get it too deeply into it now. But when you finish that exercise, the measures are right there for you. And what that exercise allows you to do to ensure that you haven't forgotten or missed a measure you might think about. So strategy is not the accumulation of measures and tasks and projects into a scorecard. It is truly thinking strategically and doing things differently. It's future oriented. So the measure design only works after the objective, the outcomes and the objectives are nailed down. Does that help, John, a little bit? Or? Okay. I promise you, I, but that's a sidebar conversation. I bet him a 12-pack. Oh. <laughs> All that alcohol tonight. We have a theme. Hey, you at least started it. Any <laughs> other questions? <laughs> Mayor Cernanek. Uh, Jerry, to make yes. sure that uh, we keep it appropriately murky tonight. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, a little bit when we when we talk about Metro Vision 2040, uh -huh. uh, we have a lot of input from stakeholders. It is a regional plan. It is not just a Dr. Cog plan. Right. Um, what do we do with those items that are not necessarily a Dr. Cog activity uh, or a, uh, uh, a, a a direct outcome from Dr. Cog activity uh, that's part of the regional plan. Well, now I don't I'm not sure if I am connecting to your question from a content standpoint. I'm going to attempt it and then you can let me know. But that aren't part of the Dr. Cog could likely end up as a local action. So if you could imagine let me just let me also tie into performance measures. The best thing we could do is share information with one another to look at collective impact. But what I would say is I look through some of the Metrovision draft, what I'm seeing are things called local actions, and they are maybe called strategy right now, but they're written like objectives. So what I would think is that we could help our local communities design something to focus in that area as well. But that's the best I can do. If you can give me an example, maybe I can get better at answering that. Uh, we'll work on it. Okay. Yeah. A, an example would help. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Oh. I would just well, I don't know. Here's the here's the or verbal I got. Or or, or <laughs> C dot. I know. <laughs> okay. If we uh, want, would if you we like want to, them to? Would you like to make a motion? Yeah. No. If we <laughs> want them to show up, we must be nice to them. <laughs> okay. All set. And they show up with money, so that's a good thing. Uh, can, Council Member Teal. So no question, just comment. Um, you know, Jerry, I'm I'm just as excited about this um, this plan, this concept of our uh, planning model as I was back in MVIC. I, I am not melancholy anymore, Bill. <laughs> I know you were concerned about that. But uh, no, I'm very excited about it. Again, um, I've used very similar uh, strategic planning tools as a young Army officer 20 years ago, as a manager in Fortune 100 companies before I ran screaming from corporate America, that is. And it's politics. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't know how that worked out, actually. But I mean, I think this is phenomenal. I think this is, is uh, for me, this is extremely helpful uh, in terms of charting a course. And uh, the, the phrase you used at MVIC just sticks with me of have, being able to have that line of sight between the mission all the way down to our strategic projects and action strategies, um, I thought was just invaluable. Thank so I think it's going to be great. Thank I you. heartily endorse it. I'm still very excited. And then um, one thing that came out of MVIC that I thought Mayor Rakowski uh, just really hit at the heart of it is the fact that we have a couple jobs here at Dr. Cog where 
uh, the the MPO, and then the we're the regional planning committee, you know, uh, organization, and those two things kind of have different pots of money and different projects. So once we get to my my the request I would make is once we get to those strategic projects and action strategies, or even going higher in terms of our objectives, mm -hmm. we can start breaking those roles out. Mm -hmm when we start getting to the meat and potatoes of this, mm -hmm. I think that would be very helpful because that can really target, um, again, our mission down through the objectives. It'll probably help us target those objectives to those specific roles Excellent. that the organization has. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if it's sort of unclear right now, welcome to the club <laughs> because it will for a while, but this dust will settle. Uh, it will settle, and we'll be spending a lot of time. But the key thing is that I do appreciate is sort of if if you're buying off on this idea that these terms will work, that we just stick with this. Because if we do, we've got a common language, and, and we'll be a lot better off, particularly as it comes to reporting. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Jerry, a.k.a. Mr. Stiegel. All right, moving on to attachment G, informational briefing, agenda item number 14. Steve Erickson uh, is going to be our presenter on our board portal. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you all for joining me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, as, as the chair mentioned, I'm going to walk you through uh, a brand new tool, and it's somewhat a brand new tool. I think uh, there are those in this room that will remember we launched uh, a spare version of this perhaps four or five months ago and asked for volunteers to help us go test this tool and give us some feedback, and so I want to publicly thank those that gave us good feedback. And now we're at a point where we'd really like to launch this new and improved tool to the entire body. So process-wise, how this is going to work is we'll be sending out an email. This is a, a, a web page or a set, a set of pages that you'll have to get to using a username and password. So we'll be sending out an email tomorrow with a temporary uh, password that will allow you to log in for the first time. I wanted to walk through this tonight and kind of give you a sense of some of the resources that, that we've included. And, and certainly give you an opportunity to, to, to uh, ask any questions that you might have on this. So just a little bit of background. Again, we, we have a lot of conversations around here about how we can better communicate with our board. And I've talked to a lot of you at the board workshop. I was talking to a number of you about ways that we could perhaps improve communication between staff and, and, and this board and, and amongst board members themselves. And one of the things that kept coming up was let's have a section of the website strictly devoted to board issues, and so we've created this portal. There's kind of a unique uh, anxiety that goes with doing any kind of a live presentation. So what I did before I started uh, today was I actually have already logged in, but I'll show you kind of where you'll log in and, and walk you through this. But I did cheat a little bit. I logged in, as you can see, up here in the upper right. That's S. Erickson uh, menu already already here. This is, you'll start off on the drcog.org website, so this is our, our main website page. It looks a little bit different, a lot of that stuff on the top um, you're only seeing because we're logged in as, as, as a user, and I actually have some superpowers as a super user on this site, so you may not see all of that, but you'll see a good part of it. So looking at this, uh, when you first go to the site, drcog.org, you'll have an opportunity here where it says log out, you'll be logging in. Uh, again, with this uh, username and a temporary password. Once you're in, there's just one more step to get to the board portal. This uh, navigation piece here I'm interested in, you'll simply click on that, and the first thing you'll see in this drop-down menu is board portal. Click on that. Voila. So here we are in the board portal, and I want to, again, give you guys just a quick tour of what's in here. Um, and again with this special or you know certain anxiety you have with doing a live demonstration I'm gonna point out Commissioner Jones did not offer me a beer or chocolate you know before I came up here to do this but the site is pretty simple I know all of you know how to use the site but I, I did want to point out the really important things that we've added particularly since the last time when some of you helped us test this out so the first thing you're going to see is something I'm pretty excited about we've been working for gosh probably six months to create a series of videos We've taken a lot of the questions and a lot of those things that we go over in orientation, a lot of the things that are in the board handbook, and we've created a series of 
nine videos. It's what we like to call snackable content. These are three to six minutes long in most cases. And I'll give you a sense of what some of the, the, the topics covered are. It's an excellent resource if you're relatively new to the board, but I think there will also be value for you if you're a seasoned board member and just want to get a refresher in a particular area or kind of go back and, uh, you know, and, and remind yourself of, of, of certain things. So you can get to it a couple of ways. Again, from that home page, you could immediately click on and play, of course, the Welcome to Dr. Cog uh, board video, and that's going to give you kind of a good overview of what we do here, give you a little bit of the, the background and history. But let's look at the other videos that are on this board member video gallery, and I'll just quickly go through those. So for each of these videos, you can actually uh, click through and get more of an explanation. I don't know if you guys are going to be able to read this real well from that distance, but uh, again, video one is, is that welcome to the board. The second video gives you an overview of our primary areas of focus. So if I click through on that, I'll get a little more of an explanation of what's included in that video. It talks about the fact that we, we have three primary areas of focus, regional growth and development, transportation planning, and aging and disabled resources. By clicking on this video, and again, this one is several minutes long, you'll learn a little bit more about that particular topic. The third video is some of the secondary areas of focus. So some of you may know I uh, oversee management of our Way to Go program. So that's one of the things we cover in that secondary uh, list of, of Dr. Cog programs. Also included would be the fire program and our Denver Regional Aerial Photography program. Those kinds of things are included in video three. Videos four and five both relate to MetroVision. We've, we're having a lot of discussions about MetroVision. These videos cover really at a high level both the key principles and then the process, sort of the process that we're all going through. And as it was pointed out earlier, uh, I think it's unique every time we go through this, this major update process. You guys really define what that is. The sixth video talks about a lot of things board, board members need to know. So we have for the first time tonight a parliamentarian. This talks about things like Robert's Rules of Order, norms and codes of conduct. Um, some of those principles of governance would be included in this, this uh, sixth video. Video seven is all about policy development, talks about our various committees. Uh, as well as some of our key strategic partners in the region and how we work with them. Video eight, um, how to be a successful board member. This is really something where we went back to some of our past board members, those uh, that had served and perhaps won the John V. Christensen Award and asked them, well, really, what does it take to be successful? We know that there's a learning curve. You know, how can we get through that learning curve more quickly? And then the last one is, is just all about acting regionally. Again, those of you that had the opportunity to join us for the award celebration saw a video, again, with four past JVC winners. And it gave kind of an overview and some of their stories about how they worked through difficult issues like uh, fast tracks and, you know, and worked collaboratively on that. So those nine videos are available for you to play on demand. They're intended to be kind of watched, if, if you're new, they're intended to be watched in order, one through nine, but they really do stand alone. If, if you choose to go and say, hey, I want to learn a little bit more about some of the key committees, you can go directly to video seven and it'll make sense to you. Uh, jumping back to uh, the board portal page, the main page, there's a link to Jennifer's most current newsletter here. Uh, those of you that, that get that, um, uh, there will always be a copy of that here and we'll be archiving copies as well. Uh, there's an opportunity, if you look down a little bit, the opportunities again to review mission and vision. Uh, there's a page that links directly to uh, members. And what you'll see in, in terms of how this is organized is that it lists our five board officers first and then it goes down and it actually lists the rest of our board members in alphabetical order by jurisdiction or by organization. So if you're curious who that uh, um, council member is from Commerce City, you can look here and it's Jim Vinson. Uh, we also have a, a listing of staff. Again, and a link with, uh, if you want to send an email directly to Jennifer or to myself or to Flo. If you're curious who that TPO director is, Transportation Planning and Operations, is his name Doug, is his name Rex? It's here either way and, and, and you can confirm that and send him an email. Uh, again, under how we work, there's a lot of really good, valuable resources. You know, some of these things are things you, you'll rarely probably refer to, but it's really important that we have these in one place, and that was really our goal with this. So you can see articles of association, our committee policy guidelines and descriptions. Here's our committee structure. Click through and, you know, and take a look at that. 
And then you, you've all been familiar with these at-a-glance packets. Everything that is currently in this at-a-glance packet is also available electronically here. I think at some point, you know, I think we launched this about a year ago, at some point we'll probably phase this out, and I think I'm going to guess fairly quickly um, so we don't need to kill so many more trees. But uh, everything in here is also on the at-a-glance uh, link uh, on the site. The board handbook, those of you that are familiar with it know it's voluminous. You can see it's broken into three sections here because, I don't know if I mentioned it, but it's voluminous. Um, and then we were talking earlier about MetroVision. There is a page that we built on the Dr. Cog website uh, to provide kind of an outline of where we're at in terms of the MetroVision update. What I, what I heard earlier related to the red line stuff is that this site is already obsolete. It's already out of date. I don't have any red line stuff on this page yet. But you are able to click through to this page, the MetroVision update page, and get a good glance at kind of where we're at and what the expected schedule is to get through this. So it, it sounds to me like we'll probably be expanding on the amount of information that's on this particular uh, page and, and, again, providing you guys with what you need. One of the new features is this questions button. So this is an opportunity both for you to ask a question of Dr. Cog. And so just in terms of how this will work is if you click on this button, questions at Dr. Cog, I don't know how we came up with that, uh, that email will actually go directly to Jennifer and Connie, and they will determine if they can answer it themselves or if they'll hand that off to somebody else on staff. Once we've determined an answer to that question, we'll both be posting your question and the associated answer here. You can see we've seeded this with, with three questions. The first one on here is what gives the Dr. Cog the authority to do what it does? And here's an answer to that. We were talking earlier about the MPO and the RPC and being the Area Agency on Aging. There's a master calendar on here. We've presented um, you know, upcoming events, uh, board-related events, both on a calendar. You can see here I can click through to tonight's board meeting and, and you'll find the agenda. One of the things you may not be aware of that you should know is that probably within about 24 hours after a board meeting, I don't know if you know, but this is being recorded, video recording, we'll post the video recording of this meeting on this same page and you, you'd be able to link through to that and, and review the video from last night's board meeting. And then again, just, yeah, because it's fun. I just want to assure Donna, this, I, I've been here three years and I've never heard us talk about beer so much in one meeting. Really? Really? I don't know. Uh, Here's another way to look at events, and actually this will get you out a little bit further. You know, one of the important things you see on here, this gets us out into August. I could have clicked through to next up here, and that gets me to the next month. But, um, you know, this puts them in chronological order, and you can see some of the events that are even coming up in August. Importantly, we have that board orientation on August 13th here at Dr. Cog. So. At 4 p.m. here, and you've all gotten an email about that. At 4 p.m. here. Yeah, in this room. And then just wrapping this up, um, news and announcements on this page. And for those of, any, uh, those of you that follow us on Twitter, you can see Dr. Cog's most recent Twitter activity. So with that, we're excited to launch this. Again, we'll send out an email tomorrow, which will allow you to get into this portal. Um, this is going to be something that will be evolving over time. I, I really look forward to additional comments about how we can improve this. This is your section of the website, and we want to make it work for you. So any questions? I mean, Council Member Jones. Hey, we can call, you can call me Susan. Um, so alternates will also be, on, uh, be able to get on this? Yes. yes. And is that it, just board and alternate, or yep. any, will anybody? And people like me with superpowers. Well, okay, but you're staff. Yeah. Um, so, but nobody else, like, from our staffs. It's just us. Right, they would have, yes. We'd have to let them on. Just yep. curious yep. to understand how this is going to work. Mayor, Mayor Rakowski and then um, Mr. Graves. I assume this is subject to Cora. I'm sorry? I assume this is subject to Cora, which would include yes. co questions asked. Mm -hmm. Mr. Graves. Thank you, Madam Chair. Really just wanted to stop and commend staff for this initiative. This is just a brilliant way to build institutional memory for the organization. And I know that several of us around here have been talking about building board capacity and really empowering the board to have materials and options that will help them to be better board members. And so I just wanted to thank you for the forward-looking approach to this website. I think it's very good. 
Anything else before? Oh, Mr. Di Council Member Dyack. Um, it, Steve, is there, a, is there a way to get contact information on for the different board members? Say if I want to contact a board member from um, Commerce City, mm -hmm. I can go on my, my portal and, and do an email or? I, I think that would not be a difficult thing to, to add. It's not currently a function of that, that the board member page that I showed you, but again, I don't, I don't believe that would be a difficult addition. I think it's, a, it's an excellent idea, John. Anything else? Okay, well, thank you very right, thank much. You. We look forward to, to uh, working more with it. All right. Um, we are moving on to our informational briefing. Oh, excuse me, our committee reports. Um, and I'm going to request that they be brief and reflect decisions made and information germane to the business of Dr. Cog. So we're going to start with Elise and the uh, stack. I'll be brief. I'm happy to report stack did not meet in June. Oh, I can't be briefer than that. Uh, I know uh, uh, the chair of the Metro Mayor's Caucus had to step out. Is there an, anyone else who is, would like to do a little update for the Metro Mayors? And, okay, seeing none, we're moving on to the MAC. Ms. Commissioner Rogier? No reports, Madam Chair. Okay, we are moving on to the RAC. Oh, no, we're not. Excuse me, JLA, Area Agency on Aging. Excuse me, Advisory Committee on Aging. Thank you. I was not there. I was in Hawaii. What? I turned 50. Uh, Yay. Yay. Happy, happy, happy birthday. Happy <laughs> birthday. Thanks. Um, we got a whole bunch of new regulations from the state unit on aging. Uh, some of that's uh, from the super circular. So our financial person, Hendrick, reviewed it with the advisory committee, talking about all the new things that we have to do. Uh, one of those, or two of those things, is they're really putting an emphasis and a performance measure in our contract with the State Unit on Aging to serve the unserved and the underserved in the region. And so Justin Martinez, who is this awesome economist here at Dr. Cog, uh, did some custom maps for us and he presented it to the um, Aging Advisory Committee and it shows in each region, this is so cool, so in, in each of your cities, like where the um, folks who are 75, Native American, and uh, over 60 are. And, and the way this is, is so helpful because, you know, we have limited resources. And this is going to allow us to, like, really focus our services on those areas and, and meet those performance goals that the state set for us. So that was really exciting. We also shared that map with our service providers, which was, uh, they were so excited about it. And then we said goodbye to Steve Watson, who is from Douglas County, our member. He retired um, from our committee. He was the, the chair of our funding subcommittee, and we are going to miss him a whole lot, but uh, had cake for him and said goodbye. So that's it. Thank you, Jayla. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, uh, Jada, can you mm -hmm. provide those maps to the municipalities? Like if I was to ask something for, for Thornton? Absolutely. They're going to be on our website, um, and uh, it, it, maybe we can even get them some information on, on the board portal for you. But I, I think it's going to be, and, and maybe even at some point since our, you know, we can have Justin come and do a presentation to y'all. That was a great idea, Val. Okay. Thank you, Jayla. All right, moving on to the rack, and I think we heard about the rack this evening. Joyce and Liz, is there something you want to add? No, I just, um, we've been working on our subcommittees, and um, the subcommittee I'm on, and we've had two meetings, and um, so those are to help with the SIP yep. planning with the SIP and uh, to meet our goals of attaining the ozone levels. Thank you. And, and for those of you, uh, who are serving extra duty on RAC, uh, much appreciated. And uh, our executive director, I'm there. Joyce is there. Uh, Elise is there. Um, if you want to know anything about air quality, ask Ken Lloyd. Uh, <laughs> moving on, the uh, report on, on E470, Mayor Rakowski. Oh, <clears throat> the last meeting was canceled, and I would defer further comments to 20, because I do want to comment about staff under uh, item 20. Okay, okay. Uh, Mr. Van Meter, a report on fast tracks, please. Sure. Last month, 
our board took no actions relating to Fast Tracks Monitoring Committee, but last night, or to, relating to Fast Tracks at their board meeting. Last night they held their Fast Tracks Monitoring Committee meeting. At that meeting they had one recommended action, and that was a recommendation to pass a resolution authorizing our general manager to execute a design build contract and other agreements for the southeast rail extension. So this is a selection recommendation uh, for a contract award for design build on the southeast rail extension to um, Balfour Beatty Rail and Parsons Brinkerhoff. That contract value is 140 million. Total project cost going forward is just under 200 million dollars. It's consistent with um, what RTD presented to Dr. Cog last year. That action passed, 10 votes in favor, four votes opposed, and one abstention. I'll note that that action requires a supermajority of the RTD board, so when it goes to the board of directors on the 28th of this month, it will require 10 affirmative, affirmative votes because it's subject to the requirements of Senate Bill 208 another portion of which has already been met, but that was um, the review and approval of that same action by the Dr. Cog Board of Directors, or not that same action, but authorization of the, um, of, of the corridor extension. So that passed. Um, also authorizing RTD to enter into a full funding grant agreement with federal um, Transit Administration, presuming we're successful for $92 million of that almost $200 million project and authorizing execution of the intergovernmental agreement that we've been working on cooperatively with Lone Tree as a representative, bringing $25 million of outside RTD local funds to this project consistent with the funding recommendation that we've been working on all along as well as right-of-way. So that was good news that it passed. Um, we also presented to the board our annual program evaluation for fast tracks. That's the annual long-term and mid-term look at our financial plan and forecasts to make sure we're still in balance. We are still in balance. The bottom line budget exists, um, expended to date plus committed remains at $5.6 billion. That was an update to our board this month. Next month we'll be asking them to adopt that budget which will set our um, budget for next year as well as confirm our longer term budget planning document. So that's my attempt at being somewhat clear and concise, <laughs> open for questions if there are any. Are there any questions? Um, a, as you may have guessed, that extension would be in the city of Lone Tree and um, we are bringing forward $25 million in cash in addition to in-kind uh, work from our community, but I have to thank the regional partners. It's not just cash from the city of Lone Tree. The business uh, community has really leaned in. Douglas County has leaned in. We've received a lot of significant support from our partners in Parker and Castle Rock and um, throughout this region, and uh, this is a very important project to my community, and I would like to really extend a heartfelt uh, gratitude to all of you at the table who have worked uh, with us to um, try and move forward and leverage the limited dollars we have uh, to build a project that's really important. And I want to also assure you that Lone Tree will be at the table for all of you as you are moving forward with the ex your extensions at RTD. And my personal commitment will be I will be testifying on any and all behalf to make sure that the fast track gets built out. And so uh, again, thanks to all who have supported the project in Lone Tree. And, um, and I will be there for you as well. So, um, and thank you to RTD. Uh, I think that was it. Oh, now we are moving on. Our next meeting is August 19th, 2015. I want to do make a, uh, another plug for attending MetroVision, which is the first Wednesday of the month at 4 o'clock in this room. Uh, any and all are welcome to participate in this process. And I think you will only benefit for, as a board member. Your community will benefit from your participation. So um, with that, I'm going to move unless uh, I'm going to move on to uh, item number 20, other matters by member. I know uh, by members, Mayor Rukowski has something to say. 
briefly. <coughs> unfortunately, and Anthony. reference our last meeting in May. Unfortunately, a very, very, very lengthy staff rec report precluded us from hearing a report, staff member report not in his capacity as a nationally recognized uh, expert on wine or as the writer of, palette, of People's Palette, <laughs> but in his lengthy service role as our senior policy and legislative analyst, Rich Morrow. Uh, his adroit threading of the legislative needle this past session was exceptional. It was probably the worst session of the legislature I can remember, so having had him toil in that vineyard, it's unfortunate he wasn't able to speak to us, uh, but I do want to give him the recognition I think he deserves. Rich, stand up. Stand up, please. Thank you, thank you for your good work. Yeah, <laughs> we heard that. <laughs> now that's a subject I can know something about. <laughs> Mr. Graves. Thank you, Madam Chair. I actually have a, a brief moment of personal privilege. First, on behalf of Mayor Hancock, I wanted to personally invite all of the members of the Dr. Cog Board of Directors to celebrate the inauguration on Monday, July 20th. So this will be in the second term for Mayor Hancock, and in fact, we'll be welcoming several new uh, Denver City Council members at that time as well. It's going to be at 11 o'clock a.m. at the Ellie Calkins Opera House down at the DCPA. If you're interested in attending, please just drop me a line personally. Second thing is, today actually marks my two-year anniversary with the city and county of Denver, and I just want to thank you all very much for the opportunity to work with you to uh, drink the regional collaboration, if you will. It's really just been a, a great opportunity for me. If ever there's something that I can do to be a better partner to you, uh, I'm always coachable and open to your feedback, so just corner me after one of these meetings. And again, thank you for the privilege. Thank you, Anthony, and congratulations. Happy anniversary. Okay. Are there are there any other matters? Yes, Councilman Suzanne. Well, I just want to give a shout out uh, about Bike to Work Day. Yes. It was another one. I, I guess the flood weather to work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Except for the weather, <laughs> that it was a big success, and I just wanted to uh, to note. I know a lot point. of work went into that. That is a great point. And staff, I know Dr. Cog's staff put in a lot of a, a lot of work. Um, and so congratulations to you guys on that success. And I think we would like to ha hear an update on numbers at some point. I from you. All right, can we, let's hear it. This is a big deal, guys, so let's okay. hear it. This was one of our most memorable Bike to Work, stay, <laughs> bike to work Days ever. Started out with a glorious morning, 60 degrees and sunny, and our, our station results plus our uh, active uh, registration numbers on the website indicate we had 32,000, I think it's 850 riders that day. Our goal was 32,000. We beat our goal. That's an increase of about 12%, I think, over last year. Mother Nature had something different in store for the no ride one. home. <laughs> Two inches of rain in less than an hour, and you know we were in touch with media. We have a crisis communications plan here. In touch with media, saying, "Please tell people just to stay put and leave your bikes, and you know find another way home, or you know go down and 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 have a nice dinner at one of the restaurants, or you know things like that." But it was very very successful, except for that weather. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Herb, the mayor. I just just say. following up on that. Uh, a demonstration of the commitment of our new director of CDOT. He got into a caravan, drove all the way out to the Flatirons for the ribbon cutting of the US 36 bikeway, and then he got on a bike. Thank God he wasn't wearing spandex. <laughs> and he rode back to Denver. But he did participate. He brought a whole bunch of staff. Uh, we had some RTD people there. We had a bunch of uh, people from around the area to open up that new segment of a bikeway on US 36. But uh, our partners did participate. Wonderful. Okay. Anything else for the good of the cause? All right. We're adjourned. Thank you guys. See you in August.